Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the budget, of course, as we said, will look at the major expenditure initiatives, the major revenue policies, uh, the economic update, fiscal performance, and debt. A lot of people are talking about debt without knowing what debt actually is and what it, what it does, what's the level of debt, etc. And then, of course, at the end of it, we can have questions. Uh, you, you can ask any question. Uh, nothing is too silly or too, uh, too hard to ask. I would, as we did in Samambula, I would urge the, uh, only the students to ask questions. The lecturers, um, are rather that they left when the students asked the questions, because I want the students to actually feel free to raise any issues they may have. In particular, we had sometimes issues about the lecturers themselves and also the conditions within the university, and we want you to be able to speak freely uh, around those issues. So I urge the lecturers to leave after the presentation. And so, like I said, please feel free to raise any issues you'd like to raise. So, uh, the budget is essentially we focus on Fijian families, build upon previous budgets, this continuation of, of course, access to infrastructure development, water, electricity, social protection, education, and health. And again, we're building on the sort of fiscal strength of the economy at the moment. We've had nine years of straight growth, which has a lot of implications. What are the major in, uh, expenditure initiatives? So we've started from the 1st of August. As you would have heard, we're giving $1,000 upon the birth of a child. Uh, some of you may soon be having babies, hopefully not too soon. But uh, once you do that, if you earn less than $30,000 a year, you're entitled to $1,000. Now, the way the system works, there's certain conditions attached. You must actually register the birth, the child first. About three, four years ago, we did a sweep around the country. There's something like 25,000 Fijians who did not have birth certificates. Some of them as old as 55 years old, 45 years old. So these people have gone through half their lives without a birth certificate. So it costs us money to go around and try and register them. This will also help us save on our cost too, because people willingly come and register their babies. The other issue, of course, we have is just before school starts at the beginning of the year, you'll find the Registrar of Birth, Deaths and Marriages office in most of the places, it's always busy. We, in fact, we have to open till late in the evening. We open on Saturdays, so a lot of the parents, what they do when the child is born, they don't register them. They only register them when they're about to go to class one. So for six years, these children don't actually have birth certificates. The other reason, of course, why we've done this, of course, is apart from helping the parents, and in particular the mother, we want people to develop a culture of savings. In Fiji, we're not very good at savings. So when you get the $1,000, you can immediately use $500. The other $500 actually sits in the bank account until the child reaches the age to be able to go to year one. So at year one, then you can take out the $500. But what we are hoping is that in those six years, when the child perhaps is the first birthday, second birthday, somebody gives some money for the child, you actually go and deposit the money into the account to build up a savings. We've also got an agreement with the bank that for the first six years of the account, they won't charge any fees, but they'll actually pay interest. So these are some of the things that we've done, and that's the reason behind it. Of course, we've also then increased the maternity leave from 84 working days to 98 working days, an additional of two weeks. So, you know, it gives mothers a um, better chance of sort of recovery or also be able to deal with the, the, the stresses of being pregnant and post-birth, postnatal uh, care too. Now, of course, this will be uh, paid, fully paid for the first three pregnancies. After the third pregnancy, as the law has provided for, it's been there for quite some time, then you get on to half of the pay, or half the time. Now, we've introduced paternity leave for the first time in this budget, and fa five days family care leave. What is paternity leave? It's applicable to the fathers of babies. So they are, can now take five days leave. Either whilst the partner is on maternity leave, pre-birth or post-birth. To any one of those times, they can take five days leave. We want fathers to become more involved with children and child rearing. It's very important. Again, sort of, you know, building solid foundations around the family. Many fathers have never changed their ba baby's diapers. We like them to do that. It's a good bonding with your child. So you're entitled to take five days leave as, a, as, the, as the father of the child. The five days family care leave is again for 
If you are working, and for example, you know, um, you at work, and then you get a call one day that your your father is ill and has to be hospitalized. There's nobody taken to hospital. So if you take time off for that, then you're entitled to five days for that. So it's not when you are sick. When you are sick, you take sick leave. When you have annual leave, that's what you're entitled to. Annual leave to take a break from work, your annual leave. Uh, it's not bereavement leave. It's actually when somebody is ill in the family, and you need to take time off for that. Now, paternity leave is obviously nobody, not everybody can take paternity leave because you've got to have a baby to have that happening. Now, what we've said, of course, this will be paid, fully paid uh, days. What we said for uh, employers who actually pay this, they can take a 150% tax deduction. Because, you know, it's a new leave and it's an additional leave. So we're saying to the employers to put less burden on them in respect of them paying out for this leave, they can have a 150% tax deduction. So it give them some form of relief. Now, one thing I forgot to mention over here with the, with the, uh, with the parenthood assistance payment, the person that can operate the account is the mother. So the account will be in the baby's name, but the mother will be the signatory to the account. So we, you know, giving women more sort of say over you know, the, the spending, etc. Of course, as advertised in the, in the Fiji Sun and various other publications, we've said in the unfortunate event that the mother passes away, then whoever is the next guardian or the living father can actually operate the account. Now for education, you can see we've increased funding for education. It's gone up to $1.035 billion. First time we've ever exceeded a billion dollars for education sector. You can see how all these different years they had the education funding. 2014 is when free education was introduced. That is paying for your full fees you know, at um, high school and primary school. And also this is when we introduced TELS and TOPPERS. You can see how every year has been increasing because more and more people are getting into university. So obviously somebody who was three years ago in the first year of university is now in the third or fourth year, but new people have come along. So their fees have to be paid too. Now I'll show you how that $1.035 billion, $1 billion is broken down. Out of the $1.035 billion, $535.4 million goes to the Ministry of Education. The Ministry of Education pays for the salaries of all the teachers in Fiji, which is over 10,000 teachers there. So we pay all the salaries, irrespective of whichever school they teach in, except for what we call the purely private schools. There's about 10 of them. You know, those who don't want to have anything to do with the education system in Fiji are set out by the Ministry of Education. Schools like the International School. There's some of the, there's about two or three small schools, faith-based schools that don't want to have anything to do with the system. The other ones, but invariably all schools, the teacher salaries we pay. So the uh, free milk, the bus fare subsidy, um, subsidy for, you know, we pay for kids to go to school if they live on an island to go on a punt to go to the school. All of that is paid from there. Now, then $123.8 million is given to higher education institutions includes your, your university. Now of that one, two, three, it's broken down into two. One is for operating grant, the other one is for capital grant. Operating grant, we have $104.8 million, which is broken down these ways. USP gets $33 million from, from us. University of Fiji, 4.2. FNU gets 65.1. Only a few years ago, you were getting about $46 million. We have increased your funding because FNU really uh, needs a lot of money pumped into it because you, in a way, bid behind USP in terms of infrastructure development, in terms of the, uh, the uh, curriculum system you have, the accreditation you have for your courses, and also the salaries being paid to your lecturers and tutors was less than what USP was actually offering. So we've made a conscious effort to actually increase the grant so you can actually pay more to your lecturers and tutors, get better quality uh, lecturers and tutors, and various other facilities at FNU. These are the other universities or campuses that actually get grants from us, you know, Vivekananda Technical College, Sangam, Montfort, the two Montfort Institutes, Fulton, Corpus Christi, CATD, etc. Capital grant, $19 million, all of which goes to FNU. So we're building a campus in Lambasa. And the Sinu campus is going to be upgraded. You're getting $4 million this year. 
The Coronivia uh, is getting upgraded, Vet Labs, the Hospital Livestock Shed, Maritime Academy is getting $5 million. $90 million is going towards the rehabilitation of the schools. So as you know, Josie, Kenny, Gita had an impact. For example, uh, schools in Kandavu, got co some of them got completely demolished. And of course, some of the Winston ones are being all paid off. Then the next one, of course, is your National Toppers. You're getting $43.8 million this year. TELS is $205.6 million this year. We've got some civil service scholarships and also scholarships uh, training. $7.2 million, and I'll give you a breakdown of that. Now, the toppers has actually used to be 630 uh, till uh, 31 July this year. It's now gone up to 950 positions for toppers. We've increased the numbers in the traditional areas of what we used to give toppers for. We've also introduced a new scholarship where you have 20 positions for undergraduate studies that are not available in Fiji. So if somebody, I mean, it's no longer applicable to you, but assuming somebody left year 13 and said, I wanted to do architecture, and they got a place in a university overseas to do architecture. So we can actually fund for them to go overseas and do that. But obviously, architecture is not available by, uh, course is not available in any of the universities in Fiji. FNU, no USP, no University of Fiji offers that, those courses. And you can see the list of the various courses that we are offering uh, studies in for which we'll pay for. So 970 uh, positions for the toppers. We also now, some of you of course uh, may be becoming teachers. Uh, we have a lot of teachers actually who've done diploma, uh, but they don't have degrees. So we want to encourage teachers to get diplomas, and specifically in these areas, maths, physics, language, literature for English, Information Technology, Industrial Arts, Special Education, Early Childhood Education. We'll be offering 30 awards for teachers holding diplomas to upgrade to degree levels. Because there's a shortage of teachers in these areas. In fact, for maths and physics, if we don't actually address the issue now, there won't be any teachers left in a few years' time in the uh, primary, and health sec uh, primary and secondary um, education system. We also now, those of you who uh, may have a bachelor's degree in teaching and you go on to teach, we will have also your ability for you to actually do a postgraduate degree and we'll pay for that in the areas of maths, physics and English. These are three key areas where we lack a lot of good teachers. I mean, I remember when I was in high school many, many decades ago, we had teachers who uh, had masters in English who used to teach us in high school. So we want that situation to come around again. Because we lost a lot of people after 1987 to Australia and New Zealand. Of course, we have uh, then uh, 10 overseas awards for postgraduate studies based on public sector needs. These are uh, for the public sector. We're also offering um, masters, 40 awards for masters, 20 of which are reserved for civil servants. And the other 20 uh, for those uh, outside the civil service in the areas of teacher training, tourism, agriculture, fisheries and forests. So assuming even if you went and worked in the private sector and you worked in the area of say fisheries or forests or tourism and you're pretty good at that and you applied and you could actually get a master's qualification, we will pay for you to go overseas to get those qualifications. Because we need to have that secondary level and tertiary level of you know, management, in particular in tourism. We want more Fijians to occupy those sort of top end positions in the tourism sector. We're offering also 10 uh, awards for PhD, five will be reserved for civil servants and five for people in the private sector. As you know, we've been funding um, um, students with disabilities to actually study at universities. We're now going to bring the allowances in alignment with all the allowances that other students get. We made some changes to TELS. As you know, with TELS, we pay for your university fees but you are also eligible to get allowances if your family earned $25,000 or less. We've now increased the income, uh, the threshold to 50000 So those of you who did not qualify because your family had earned more than 25000 but less than 50000 you'll now be eligible to claim those allowances. We're also increasing bus fares to be increased to $30 a week. We have a lot of people who may be traveling, say, from Navua to Suva, Bombard to Lotoka, etc. So, then bus fare is necessary for that. 
We also recognize that because of the fact there is a shortage of doctors in Fiji, we want to encourage more people to do medicine. There are some people who have already done a science degree who may already be a pharmacist and it's easier for them to get an MBBS because they can get cross credits. So we've spoken to the Fiji School of Medicine, to your uh, VC, so 30 places are, are reserved for that, uh, those positions. Now there's a lot of uh, talk about TELS and the payment of TELS. We have introduced what we call an accelerated repayment initiative uh, for, for TELS. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, you have to pay for your university education. There are, of course, some politicians coming around and saying, don't worry, we'll forgive your debt. You don't have to pay the university fees. But they only look, it's, it's, it's hoodwinking you. Reality is 50% of the population today is below the age of 27. 70% is below the age of 40. Now most of you would be, I assume, somewhere between 18 and 25. I assume most of you, apart from the lecturers who are here. Now, you would very soon be also having children yourselves. And we've also got another 50% of the people, or maybe another 40% coming behind you. They also want to go to university. So in order to have that level of funding available, there needs to be some payment done. Already the debt from TELS is over $700 million. You cannot sustain it year in, year out. So people need to make some sort of payment because we should not be selfish. You can't just think about yourself. The reason why the politicians are telling you that because they want your vote. I'm more interested in the students also in high schools and primary schools. There are schools, for example, in Bua that don't even have a computer. They don't even have a science lab. There are schools with holes in the ground run by various committees. Holes in the floor, sorry. So, you see, these are the fundamentals we need to address. So you need to have a certain level of sustainability. They're not talking about high schools because high school students don't vote. They're not eligible because they're below the age of 18. So what we have said, and we've been toying around this with quite some time, in order to expedite payment, in order to get some payment, we've come up with the Accelerated Repayment Initiative. Now, assuming that you are doing a teaching course here, getting a bachelor's in education, and if you get the full TELS allowance, assuming you get all the full TELS allowance, the living allowance, etc., etc., your debt would be approximately about $34,000. We've done some calculations, about $34,000. Now, you can pay that over the next 10, 15 years. You know, the maximum you'll pay is 20% from your salary. We can't deduct any more than that. So what we are saying to you, if you are able to pay your debt, say assuming you sit here somewhere, you p it's over there, there, assuming you pay your debt in three years or less, if you pay 50% of your debt in three years or less, we'll forgive the balance of the 50%. You'll write it off. The reason why we're doing that is because if you pay the debt sooner, we get the money sooner. And the value of the dollar is obviously a lot more buoyant than if it was paid over 15 years. With the dollar we're giving you today, obviously, the same dollar won't be the same value in 15 years' time. So you'd rather get that money upfront. So if you pay 50% of your debt in three years or less, the, the balance of the 50% will be written off. If you pay the, uh, the loan, your debt, 75% in three to six years, we, f we write off 25%. Yep, we write off 25%. If you pay 90% within six to eight years, we write off 10%. So in that way, you are free of debt. But that way we get our money quicker because we've got all these people coming behind you who we have to educate to. We have to pay for the fees. We have to build new schools. This is why in the budget this year you'll see, and I haven't put it up here, we've set aside funding to do a stock take of all the high schools in Fiji. What condition they're in, how they need to be funded, do they have a science lab or not. We're working with the Australians in helping with identify some of the gap analysis. So we need to think about sustainability. So that's the accelerated payment system that we've uh, come up with. We've also said as part of the submissions we receive from many of the students, we're developing an app now, so within a few months' time, your mobile phone, every six months, you'll get a notification as to how much debt you have. So, you know, sometimes people have said to us, oh, you know, I've taken an allowance, 
and I was not paid. And if it shows in a statement, you can then dispute it. So in this way, it gives you a clear update. So if you, for example, start with the first year of your, of your degree, after six months, you show how much money you've been, uh, been uh, created to your account. A year later, you know how much has been created to your account. So you keep a tab on it. So in that way, it creates a lot more transparency. Now, what are some of the other initiatives we've got? We've got the first home purchase grant. This was there in a play for the past few years, but we refined it. We've created a new Ministry of Housing and Community Development with a budget of about $41 million. The rate of home ownership in Fiji is very low. Most people don't buy their first home until they reach the age of 30 or in their mid-30s or 40s. We want you people, when you get out of university, one of the first priorities you should have is try and buy your own home. It's very important. Because it is creating for you an asset. But we have to change our concept of what is a home. Many of us think a home is one block of land with one building in the middle of it. No, that's one concept. There's another concept. You can actually own apartments or flats. If you go overseas, that's what people also call homes. You can get a 99-year lease. The reason why we're saying that, because the cost of that will be far less than you having to buy one block of land, build a house on it. So you can get a two-bedroom flat, which you can have a 99-year lease over, a freehold title over, and what you call strata titling. And it may cost you eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000. If you, for the purposes of, if somebody develops it, we're talking to FNPF. If, for example, FNPF develops such a block, and you come and say, look, I've got my first job. I have got, you know, I earn $30,000, I earn $25,000 a year, and I want to buy this one-bedroom apartment, and the price is $75,000. For those purposes, if you buy for approved starter titling, we will give you actually $15,000 as our contribution for you to contribute towards the purchase of that. Right? You may have some savings, $5,000, $10,000, you go to a bank, the bank approves the loan. So that's your first asset. Then as you earn a bit more, you may want to buy a two-bedroom apartment. Or you may get married. You and your partner, both of you are earning. So suddenly your income is doubled. You can go and perhaps sell that apartment and buy a block of land and build a house. Or you move into a three-bedroom apartment. It's very important to do that because I can tell you there's a high rate of people in Fiji today who go to money lenders. A lot of people go to money lenders because they don't have an asset. So somebody comes along and says, oh, you know, I want to, I need $5,000. My father got sick and I need to, you know, pay for something. Or my sister's getting married, I need to contribute. Or somebody died in the family, I need $3,000. So you go to the bank and the bank says, what can you give as an asset for collateral? Sorry, you got nothing. So a lot of people end up going to money lenders. And I've said this before, I have seen footage. You know when you get your pay, when the money hits your bank account, it hits your account at around about 3 a.m. in the morning. That's when the banks transfer the money. And you'll see around about 4 a.m., some dude with this many ATM cards <laughs> and the PIN numbers taking out the money. These are the money lenders. These are the money lenders who you give your ATM card as security. We want to avoid that because, of course, the interest rate there is quite high and you don't actually get to save then. So this is why we're encouraging that we need to change our concept of what is our house. So if you earn below uh, $50,000, uh, we give a grant of, uh, you know, fifteen to 10000 If you earn over fifty to hundred, we give a grant of ten and $5,000. If you're buying your first lease, this is actually what we call first land purchase. Many people, for example, go to TLTB, they can get a lease, they have to pay upfront of ten, fifteen thousand dollars to purchase the lease. Or they go to uh, lands department to purchase the lease. They need to pay fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, whatever the case may be, depending on the size of the land. We'll contribute towards that too. We'll give ten thousand dollars directly to TLTB or Department of Lands. Last year we started a, a system where the Reserve Bank started lending to banks who were lending money to low-income families who were buying homes. So the bank lent to these uh, banks, the Reserve Bank lent to these banks at the rate of 1%. Then the banks charged you 4.5, 4.8% interest rate. They had to charge less than 5% 5, 5 or less. 
Now, assuming a bank is charging 4.2%, what we are saying now, going forward, that we will subsidize further by 1%. So instead of you paying 4.2%, you'll pay 3.2% for the next three years to encourage you to continue the payments and make it attractive for you to buy your first home. We also set aside seven fifty. Sorry, we also set aside seven fifty thousand uh, dollars for the cost of survey of lands. There are many people, for example, who live on lands like Bakabanua arrangements, or they have an agreement to lease, but the land is not surveyed. Now, in order for them to get a proper title, they need to get the land surveyed. If you go to Vudi, there's a lot of places like that. People have been living there for years, but the moment you get the land surveyed, then they can get a proper lease, then they can go to the bank, borrow money, build a proper home. So that's what this is here for. We, of course, are continuing with social housing, one-third, two-third contribution. There's new policy being developed in that respect. And the issuance of proper leases to Fijians living in informal settlements. We're doing a lot of squatter uh, developments also. Now, before I get on to the next slide, at the moment, for example, if you fall sick, I mean, assuming you live on this campus, and you wake up in the morning, you're not feeling very well, and uh, you want to go and see a doctor and see what's wrong with you. Uh, now, obviously, a lot of students, a lot of people can't afford to go and see a private doctor. So they'll go to over here, Valilewi Health Center. When we go to Valilewi Health Center, there's a long queue in the morning. What we want to do from 1st of Jan and what we will do from 1st of Jan next year is that we will give you the ability to go and visit a private doctor for what we call, you know, ordinary uh, medical uh, checkups. So I'm not feeling well, I've got the flu, I'll go there. Of course, if I've chopped my finger off, I'll go to the hospital. If I've got a very deep gash, which a GP cannot handle, then I'll go to the hospital. This is a system that many overseas countries have. So you can then go to a GP. When you go to a general practitioner or private doctor in this area, we, you don't pay a single cent, we will pay it for you on your behalf. The whole idea is that you develop relationships with a doctor in your area. What you become, what you call family doctors. You go to places like Australia, New Zealand, they have what you call a family doctor. So if I live in here, if I live in Nandera, there may be five or six private doctors. So I can go and visit one of them all the time. I may go there, my spouse may go there, my children may go there. They become the family doctor. They know your family history. So we will pay for that. Of course, we need the money to pay for that. How will we pay for it? So I'll tell you in the next slide how we'll pay for it. But before that, at the moment by law, all employees in Fiji have to pay 1% of the salary bill and contribute to FNTC, which is of course run by FNU, FNTC levy. And he runs a chain of supermarkets. Now, all the entire salary he pays, assuming he pays a salary of $100,000 a week to his staff, cumulative, 1% of that he has to pay his FNTC levy. If he provides any in-house staff training, he can claim some of that back. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't provide training. So what we've said is from next year, from 1st of Jan, we collect approximately $21 million through FNTC levy. Of that $21 million, 50% of that will go towards paying for the doctors. You know, the doctors you go and visit is the GPs will pay for it from there. 40% of the $21 million will go towards pay, paying for workers' compensation. At the moment, if I'm at work, assuming I'm, work, I'm working and I'm using a machine and the, with the old law, if I put my finger inside the machine and it gets chopped off, then I have to go through the process of getting workers' compensation. My employer is supposed to have insurance. A lot of employees in Fiji don't even have insurance. Like the story I told the other day that I knew of a subcontractor who got some road working uh, contract up uh, somewhere in the Singatoga Valley. The truck driver who was working for him was driving along, the truck tumbled, the driver you know, got crushed and he died. But the person who employed him did not have any workers' comp. So you can imagine the hardship his family will have to go through to get some form of compensation. Probably won't end up getting any. Because you'll have to try and sue the employer. The employer may say, well, I've gone bankrupt. A lot of people get away with it. A lot of employees get away with it. As we've done with third-party insurance, from the 1st of Jan next year, if I'm at work, I lose my finger, there's a price on it, I get that paid out. 
But that's how it works in, for example, Australia, New Zealand, various other places. If I'm right-handed, the cost of my limbs on my right hand will be more than the one on the left. Of course, if I want to go and get paid more, I can take the employer to court. But this provides what we call a no-fault system. Because under the current system, if my finger gets chopped off, then the employer will say, actually, he was partially to contribute towards the chopping of the finger. This negligence on his part. Because, you know, he was, I think, uh, trying to sing a song and look the other way and his finger went inside accidentally. Or he did not wear the right gloves. Under the no-fault system, if I'm at work, I get injured, I get paid out, period. There's no assigning of blame. The same way with third-party insurance. Before, under the old scheme, we recently paid out for a little boy, unfortunately, who died here in Khalsa Road. He ran out in front of the bus. A car came along, hit him, and he died. Under the old system, he would not have been paid out, or his family would not have received any compensation. They would said, it's his fault. He ran out. So it's called contributory negligence. So that's what we've done with workers' comp. They'll start from the 1st of Jan. And the way we'll pay for it is that 40% of the $21 million will go towards pay payment of that. 1% will continue to be deducted for FNTC levy. Uh, with social welfare recipients, and also now for civil servants, we've introduced a very basic form of insurance. We've already done this for sugarcane farmers, copra farmers, dairy farmers, rice farmers. It costs us only $50 a year for one person. So we thought about this scheme because at the moment we have a lot of people on social welfare. So if you have a person on social welfare, assuming they're not obviously that wealthy, and we're paying them social welfare, assuming their house catches on fire, gets burned down. Who do you think they're going to run to? They'll come to government. So, we obviously then have to fork out the money. But if we have insurance, the insurance company will pay that out on our behalf. If assuming that I receive pension and I die, now, my family may not have enough money to meet my funeral expenses. That's covered. They also get a payment upon death. Personal injury, $3,000. So it's costing us about $5 million to pay for the uh, social welfare recipients and the civil servants, including the, those in the disciplined forces, costing us $5 million, but we're covering approximately 100,000 Fijians with $5 million. At least they have some form of social security in that respect. We are also currently working on insurance for homes and also crop insurance. This is from cyclones. You know, we've spent $125 million in uh, health for homes after Cyclone Winston. $110 million after Josie, Kenny and Gita. Of course, we know some people stole from the system. So what we're trying to do is trying to introduce what we call parametric insurance. The way parametric insurance works is assuming all of this is Fiji. And we'll cover all the low-income households. Of course, the rich people can do their own insurance. And if the cyclone, for example, goes down this path, all the people who have been identified in the insurance policy, we won't come and check their homes, we'll simply pay them out. That's how parametric insurance works, and it's capped. So maybe $3,000, $5,000. The moment it's done, there's no less pressure on us. But we'll actually pay for the premium. So we have a million dollars that's been allocated at insurance premium. For this, we're really hoping to get this product launched before the cyclone season in November. And also for crop insurance. Now, as highlighted by the Solicitor General, who's also the Chair of YLSE, giving approximately $40 million to um, the ICT sector. Substantial amount of money, digital government transformation, many of the mobile phone apps are launched for government now. You can lodge complaints now, this, hopefully you've got that. You can go and get the YLSE, um, the app on that through YLSE. You have complaints mechanism, you can go to any government department, all the phone numbers, the names of people right down to the director level is there. In about four to six weeks' time, we're launching things where you can register births on your mobile phone apps. You can do title searches. All of that is being done. The Singaporeans are actually helping us with that, which is great. But it also creates a lot of jobs in the ICC, ICT sector for those of you who, who are studying in that area. Because we need you to look after the systems for us. A lot of jobs have been created as a result of that. Now, uh, while this is, as you know, also the television... If, I go, if you go to the southern tip of Lao, if you go to Rotuma, you go to Dikombia, you go to the interior of Naitasiri, Ba, wherever it is, Vanuelevu, you can get wireless TV now. Either through what you call terrestrial means, through an aerial, 
or through a dish. 100% coverage. We've bought space with satellites so they can actually beam it to wherever you are in Fiji. All you need is a set-top box which we'll be giving out as prizes and hopefully you can receive that. We also give set-top boxes for free for those people who earn less than $30,000 a year. You get eight channels, free-to-air channel. Once you get the box, you don't have to pay any subscription. Now, what we're also doing, uh, of course, the FNU campuses are all covered. It's costing us money, but we believe it needs to be done. If you go to the supermarket and you say buy groceries and you don't have any cash on you, but you've got money in your bank account, you, use your, you take out your ATM card, you swipe your card on the machine or the lady swipes the card on the machine. That machine is called a pause machine, point of sale machine. Now, when you swipe your card and assuming you pay $50, I buy at his supermarket. When I buy $50 worth of groceries, I get charged 40 cents for using that service by the bank. The bank also charges him 30 cents. So on one transaction, the bank makes 70 cents. So we've now, because we've been talking to the banks, we've got the banks to agree that from the 1st of Jan, they are not going to charge 40 cents to me. No more customer transaction costs if you use a point of sale trans um, uh, machine, which is good. Now, he still has to pay 30 cents. We're now talking to the banks to try and get their fees to be reduced. Why do we want that? Is because we want more electronic transactions. We want more shops. In fact, we want all the shops in Fiji to have a pause machine. Now, why do we want them to have a pause machine? A couple of reasons, a few reasons. One of that, of course, is convenient. You can use a point of your card anyway. You don't have to carry cash. You carry cash, you can drop it. Somebody can you know, slip it out of your pocket, whatever it is. That's one reason. The other reason, of course, is that when the cash, when I pay for my groceries, I've got an A and Z account. When I pay for it, assuming that Anil's uh, business has got an account with Westpac. When I pay that $50 for the groceries, my money gets transferred from my account into his Westpac account. The money never leaves the system. The money stays within the system. When I take out cash and pay cash, the money is taken out from the financial system. When the money stays within the system, there's a lot of cash in the banks. right? Because it just gets moved from A to B to C to D to E. So it stays within the system. When it stays within the system, that means there's a lot of cash. That means the banks aren't hard up for cash. So when you go to borrow, when you go and take out a loan, the interest rate will be cheaper. Right? So, but if you all physically take out the cash, the banks don't have enough cash. Or there's less cash. So when there's less cash, when you borrow the cash, they'll charge you a high interest rate. But if we leave the cash within the system and carry on with our business and move money from here to there, the interest rate will be cheaper. You can borrow more money. It'll be cheaper for you to do that too. That's the other advantage. The other advantage, of course, is he doesn't have to go to the bank to bank the money. It's already banked. It's like those e-ticketing. You see, before all the buses, all these coins, at the end of the day, then they have to count all the coins. Then somebody should put it in a bag, put a handcuff, put it in a bag, then go to the bank. They're going to queue up in the bank. It takes two hours to count all the money. People get frustrated. They have to stand in lines. That's the advantage of it. The other advantage, of course, is by doing electronic transactions, I know exactly how much money he's making. So we know he's paying the right amount of taxes. That's the other advantage of electronic transactions. So we've allocated some funding there to pay for this. But we've also got some money allocated to subsidize pause machine purchase. So a point of sale machine costs approximately 500 Australian dollars, 750 Fijian. So what we've said, we'll subsidize 50%. We want to go to new shops, more shops and say, why don't you have a pause machine? We'll pay for this, It'll be easier for you. You don't have to go to the bank. The moment we bring down the transaction cost, then you can go and do a lot of purchase. In New Zealand, I can walk in and buy a bottle of water through my ATM card. Over here, they'll say minimum purchase $10. We want you to be able to buy a Chinese lolly through your ATM card. <laughs> That's the position we want to reach. In that way, the financial system remains a lot more buoyant. <coughs> 
Uh, improving health and medical services, of course, we're funding, you know, we're building a lot of uh, hospitals, subdivisional hospitals up in Kayasi. Valilewu is going to be upgraded in this year's budget. We've got that allocation. Kidney dialysis, a lot of song and dance being made by one or two political parties about this one in particular. But the reality is we're working with Dr. Krishna, who's the, who's the only nephrologist in Fiji and indeed the South Pacific. There's only about 600 people who may need access to kidney dialysis. So what we said, we're sending one uh, center up here in Nandera actually, and one in Nandi, uh, cost of $150, and people can go and get the dialysis done. If you earn less than $30,000, then we pay 50% of that cost. Free medicine will continue. The only difference is that now they'll give the medicine and they'll simply invoice government for that. We're setting up a public-private partnership, the PS. Sorry, I'm accompanied here by the PS economy, Makreta Konrote. Uh, Shuri Gounder, who's the head of fiscal uh, policy in Ministry of Economy, is here with us too. Uh, we have, of course, Kamal Gounder, who is here somewhere. Uh, he's not here, but he's also in planning. And we have Pankaj Singh, who's the head of debt. And you saw Talemaimbao who looks after the budget. These are the key people in the Ministry of Economy. Um, and the Shiri and uh, PS and I were in India about a week and a half ago meeting various hospital providers who are interested in setting up a PPP with FNPF to run Lotoka and Bar hospitals. So what we're going to do is that we have certain conditions. We'll give them a concession. But they must provide 24-7 open heart surgery facilities in Fiji. Most of the people who are dying in Fiji now are dying of cardiovascular problems. That's a big issue. We don't have very healthy hearts because we're not really looking after ourselves. Of course, there's some genetic predisposition for some people, but the reality is there's a, a huge requirement for that. The unfortunate thing is if today any one of us has a heart attack now, there's no Fijian doctor that can carry out open heart surgery. You have to go to Australia, New Zealand, India, wherever to get that surgery done. So that's part of the condition. We've also said they have to build a new wing. They'll also need to provide chemotherapy for cancer patients and also oncology services, etc. So the whole idea is to build up the tourism industry as far as tourism is concerned. But first and foremost is to provide medical services to our own people. Uh, very quickly, sugar and agriculture. Uh, sugar, of course, we're providing what we call the input cost uh, subsidy. You know, some people are talking about, oh, we'll give $100 a ton for sugar. That's actually a nonsense because what is really of significant, uh, of significant issue is how much does it cost you to produce that ton of sugar? Somebody can give you $100 a ton of sugar, but what if it costs you $90 to produce that ton of sugar? Your margin is only $10. We can give you $85 a ton, but if the cost of producing that ton of sugar is... $45 that you're making a margin of $35 or whatever the difference is. If it costs you $50 to make a ton, you're, you're making a profit of $35. So this is why we're giving subsidy at the input level. We decide subsidy, fertilizer, etc. We set up a sugar, a sugar stabilization fund. We have guaranteed farmers now $85 a ton for the next three years. So if the world market price for sugar, say, in the coming year is $65, the farmers will still get $85. Because the balance of that will come from the stabilization fund. Now, assuming the following year, the world price of sugar goes up to $95. The farmers will get $85. That $10 will keep in the stabilization fund just in case the next time it goes below that. They'll pay for that. <coughs> That's what you call a subsidization, uh, stabilization fund. Ministry of Agriculture, very quickly, has been given increased budget of $96.8 million dollars. Goat meat industry, this is a very important project for us. You know, today, if Crest Chicken closed down, you won't be able to buy chicken. And rooster goes down, you will have to import our chicken from overseas. Because of one company, we be, uh, we've become actually self-sufficient in poultry. Now, Generally, before, maybe about 30, 40 years ago, 40 years ago, if you wanted to eat chicken, you go to somebody's backyard, you go out to the farm, then you buy one chicken, then you kill it, and you, you know, put hot water and clean, pull out the feathers and all that. Now you need chicken, you go to the supermarket. You buy frozen chicken. Because an entire industry has been created around it. And of course, crest chicken does not grow all its own chickens. They go to villages, they go to farmers, they say, here's 100 chicks, you grow it, 
I'll buy it at you at this price after 36 weeks. And that's how people make money. A lot of people are doing that, it's supplying to Crest. So Crest really has become the abattoir for killing chickens and they do the freezing, they do the value adding. We want to do that with the goat meat too. Huge demand for it. I'm sure Anil would like to sell goat meat every day in his supermarket. And you want to be able to buy goat meat. Everybody in Fiji eats, whoever eats meat, eat goat meat. It's lean meat and we need to be able to provide that ability for people to actually earn a living from it. There's one farm between Ba and Tavua, they already have a thousand goats. And they've said to us, look, we have the ability to give small kids, you know, small baby goats are called kids. Ability to give kids to farmers, to villages, etc. They can grow it for us, we'll buy it from them at a particular price. They do the slaughtering, they package it, nice package, give it to the supermarkets, you go off and buy it. You don't have to wait for your uncle from Lambasa to send you the goat. <laughs> or Kandavu. <laughs> they hide other things underneath it too. <laughs> yeah? So that's what we're doing. We're trying to develop a goat meat industry. We also, in respect of uh, brucellosis free farms, at the moment, you know, we had TB and brucellosis break out in the dairy industry. So you have a farm, you may have four or five cows that are affected. What they're doing currently is they cull those four or five cows, in other words, kill those cows. But in order to do what they do, for example, in New Zealand, if one farm even has two or three cows affected, they kill the entire lot. They cull it. They clean out the pasture. Only then can you really address the issue. So that's what we intend to do with this scheme that's starting from next year, uh, this financial year. Civil service reforms obviously are continuing. They're going to get what we call a PMS under the PMS system, performance management system, get individually assessed and they'll get back paid from the 1st of August. And of course the Ministry of Itauke Affairs staff, not sorry, not the Ministry of Itauke Affairs staff, the Itauke Affairs board and the provincial councils have had a pay rise, we've given them a higher grant for them to be able to have the salaries in alignment with the civil servants. Because as you know, the civil servants had a pay rise and these people did not. So we've actually brought the salaries in alignment. So very quickly, uh, STT and ECAL. Uh, if you go and watch a movie at Village 6 or Damodar City, if you go and stay at a hotel, if you go and rent a car, if you go and drink pub at a beer, uh, a pub at a beer, if you go and drink beer at a pub, sorry, <laughs> I'm very tired. If you drink beer at a pub, you pay STT and ECAL. Service turnover tax and, and environment and climate adaptation levy. Now, when we introduced ECAL, we said by law, the money we collect from ECAL must be kept aside. Normally when government collects taxes and various revenue, we put in one pot, then we pay for things from out there. But with ECAL, what we have to do we have to um, uh, set that money aside and only use it for environmental issues, climate adaptation measures. We've moved three villages to higher ground. There's another 43 villages we have to move to higher ground because otherwise they'll get inundated with rising sea levels. There are various other projects, rural electrification, etc. So by law, we have to publish that and this is what it is. You can get all of this on our website. It sets out for you exactly where the monies have gone to water projects, rural electrification, various uh, mitigation measures, various adaptation measures. So all of that is here. Now, what we've done is we've said that any hotel, pub, a restaurant, that where you paid STT and ECAL, you no longer have to pay that if your income is $1.25 million or less, your, uh, your turnover, gross turnover. So they're exempt. So if you decide after you finish university, you've done tourism, you say, I want to set up a five-room motel. And if you make more than, uh, less than $1.25 million, you don't actually have to pay STT and ECAL. The people come and stay at your resort or hotel, they don't have to pay that. So we've exempted that. Now remember, I heard uh, somebody gave me some literature the other day. Some political party was campaigning somewhere and they told the people there and they gave out literature. They said, oh, you know, when we come in, we'll remove STT and ECAL, so the price of your groceries will come down. That's nonsense. At the moment, you don't pay STT and ECAL on groceries. You only pay if you stay at a hotel, you rent a car, if you go and watch a movie, you go to the pub to drink, or you, to go, you go and eat at a very expensive restaurant. Of course, you go to Singh's Curry House, you go somewhere here, you don't pay anything. 
you know, if you go to an expensive restaurant, dinner or somewhere like that, or the hotel, that's only when you pay STT and ECAL. Again, like I said, 150% tax deduction for uh, salaries paid to for paternity leave, family care leave. Staff training, if you start working for somebody and they spend money on you to train you, then they can claim 150% tax deduction. If a company does research in ICT and renewable energy, they can claim 250% tax deduction. Now, ICT incentives also. We believe there's a huge opportunity in ICT area in Fiji. So, in ICT sector, if you invest in it, you get various tax holidays. We've now expanded the scope of the services an ICT company can provide. So, if they provide in any of those areas, they get tax exemption also. If you go to Tapu City and you look back on Cumming Street and Mark Street, you see the buildings look very dirty and ugly. They have not been done up for quite some time. So we now are giving them incentive. If they invest and upgrade their buildings, put disability access, upgrade their buildings, they spend a million dollars, they'll qualify for 25% investment allowance. So they can do that. So we want our towns and cities and buildings to look good. Even in Valley Levu, they can do that too. Uh, we are hosting the ADB annual meeting. It's never been held in the Pacific. We'll have about 4,500 people descend upon Nandi next year in May. It's just for one week. So it's a big, big issue for us and big honor for us too. But of course, if anybody wants to contribute towards the cost of hosting that, they'll get a 250% tax deduction. We'll also be reaching out to university students for you to act as chaperones. There'll be a lot of people out there. So some of you who may be doing accounting or economics, etc., will be in fact giving you first preference to come out and uh, work and help us in, in those instances. If anybody buys an electric bus, we get a 55% capital deduction. We're actually working with ADB on getting electric buses in Fiji. And of course, if you set up electric charging stations, you also get various tax incentives. Um, imported fruits in Fiji, the duty used to be 32%. We brought it down to 15, then we brought it down to 5. Now it's zero rated. So any of these fruits, uh, the duty has been zero rated, so it should be cheaper now. We've also uh, zero rated duty on tea, tea that you drink every day, the normal duty on that. We've increased the duty on carbonated and sweetened drinks. We, we, in, uh, we increased uh, a new, uh, we, sorry, introduced a new tax for this on local carbonated drinks, but we found a lot of the businesses started bringing cheap imported carbonated drinks. So of course we put up the duty for that because we want you to drink less of it because we have too much diabetes. A lot of parents give a lot of sweetened drinks to their kids. You'll find that a lot of young people are also developing diabetes too. Drink boo, drink water. Occasionally you may have a sweet drink. Um, cigarettes and alcohol, of course, it went up by 15% too. Plastic bag, the levy has gone up from 10 cents to 20 cents from the 1st of August. Of course, if you go to the market and buy something, you buy, say, some bele or choreya or whatever it is, they put it into the plastic bag, they don't charge you a levy. This levy is only at supermarkets, pharmacies, and you know, service stations, etc. We put it up to 20 cents, but please be warned that plastic bags will be completely banned by 2020. So we're giving you nearly a two years head start. Get used to the idea of not having plastic bags. I remember as a kid, which is nearly like you know, 53 years old, 53 years ago, that's when I was born, when we were kids, we did not have plastic bags. When you went to the market, you actually took the sacks with a handle on it. Jholi, they called it. Right? So we call it Jholi. So you make it out of that. A lot of uh, uh, women's groups are making these bags. You can buy it off them. Five bucks. It's reusable. We need to get used to the idea because plastic is actually a bane on our society. Huge problems. If you go to some of the mangroves, you'll see the problems we've got. A lot of tourists come to Fiji because we supposedly have pristine environment. And I wouldn't want them to walk along Suva Foreshore. <laughs> it's actually quite embarrassing. See the amount of things that people are throwing in. You find diapers now. Diapers with everything inside it being thrown into the sea. Fridge being thrown in the sea. Washing machines being thrown into the sea. Basins, everything. We really need to take this very seriously, otherwise we'll have huge problems. Huge problems. Um, you know, we, we, a few years ago, we said you cannot bring in cars that are older than five years because obviously we want cars that are, have newer technology. So what we found is that a lot of car dealers are now bringing in cars 
that are like four years in 11 months. Four years in 10 months, because it's cheaper. So in order to incentivize these car dealers to bring in cars that are newer, we are saying if you bring in cars that are two years or younger, then your duty will be halved. So instead of paying 32%, you'll pay 15%. So hopefully you'll get more newer cars coming in. Of course, the newer the technology, the better fuel efficiency, less carbon footprint. And similarly for taxis, they will half their duty rate and they'll pay 7.5%. Now, just very quickly toward getting towards the end of the presentation. You see, the gross domestic product or the value of the goods in the country has increased and today sits at a value of $11.3 billion. Our GDP in 1970 was $0.2 billion. And then it became $1 billion, $2 billion, $3.6 billion, $5.6 billion. Now you can see it's almost doubled from 2008 to 2018. Why? Because our economy has been growing consecutively every year for the last nine years. And that has many positive implications. So, you see it's jumped from 5.6 to 11.3. And what are the reasons? If you look at it here, you see we've had since 1970, one year it'll grow, the other year it may go down, it may grow for two years, then goes down again. When you have unbroken growth, it gives you this. Unemployment rate has gone down to 4.5%. 40,000 jobs has been created in the last five years. Look at the job advertisements, it's gone up. 2017, 23,000 job advertisements. FNPF new compulsory membership has gone up to 20,795. So even if you take out those people who have completely withdrawn, it gives you a net FNPF membership of 13,000. That's a direct result of the economy growing consecutively. Now, we are set to grow again for all these years. Now you can see over here, it did grow but at a very modest amount. But the fact is it grew. The reason why it went down here is because of Winston. Winston cost us 1.3 billion US dollars. In the sense that our GDP, we lost 1.3 billion dollars worth of our GDP. A third of our GDP. Devastating impact. But despite that, we grew at 0.4% as a result of which we've grown nine years straight in a row. Which then gives you this. Now if we are growing again for another three years, you can imagine the impact of it. So therefore it is very critical from an economic perspective to always have consistency in economic policies. If you look at the policies we've announced, there hasn't been any changes to the tariff structure much at all. Just a bit of tweaking here and there. There's been no fundamental change to the policies overall. We've, for example, put a focus on families, maternity leave, etc. But there's no fiscal, fundamental shift in fiscal policy. So it gives that confidence, gives confidence to the market, and then people are more readily investing. You look around now in Suva, look around in Navua, look around in Nasori, look at the amount of new construction that's taking place, renovations, etc. That's creating that impulse in the economy. Now, <coughs> the other thing that people talk about is inflation. Now, as I gave the example today, most of you in this room eat bread. Most of you in this room eat roti. Most of you in this ro a room eat cakes or pani keke or bamba cow, whatever the case may be. Now, all of those things are made out from flour. What's flour made out of? Wheat. Do we grow wheat? No. Where do we buy our wheat from? Australia. Who makes flour for us? Two companies only. FMF, Punja and Sons. Now when FMF and Punja and Sons go out to Australia to buy the wheat, we can't tell them what price to sell it to us at. If today Australia sells us the wheat at $100 a ton, that's fine. They bring in the wheat at $100 a ton, they keep it in the silos, they grind the wheat, it becomes flour. Then we as government price control it, because we know it's a basic item. So we price control it. So they'll say to us, look, we bought it $100 a ton. They tell this to the Commerce Commission. We bought it $100 a ton. 
This is how much electricity we sp uh, spend to make this wheat. This is how many people we employ. This is our overhead cost. Da 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 da. We want a margin of this much. Commerce Commission says yes, no, whatever it is. So they give you a four percent margin. Now this is the price you'll get sold at to the supermarkets. Then the supermarkets will have a margin too on that price control. And that's how you buy it. Now, so assuming as a result of that, you're buying the flour at $4 a kilogram. And they're buying the wheat at $100 a kilogram, just hypothetically. Tomorrow, if Australia decides to put up the price of wheat to $200 a kilogram, what can we do about it? As they say, colloquially speaking, jack all. We can't do anything about it. Because they control the price. We have to buy it at that price. Only when the $200 lands in Fiji, they make the flour, then they'll say to us, hey, instead of buying $100, you bought it $200. So the price at which I'm going to sell it to you is this much. We say, okay, we can't help it. We price control it. Same thing with fuel. We buy all our fuel from Singapore. The irony, of course, is Singapore does not produce a single ounce of oil. But they brew, buy crude oil from the Middle East, and then they refine it themselves and we buy it from them. They, of course, their leaders were very smart in the 1960s and 70s. Perhaps ours weren't that smart. But the fact of the matter is they obviously have a much bigger population base next to them, so that helps them too. But the fact of the matter is if the price of fuel goes up, we can't control it. The price of crude oil in 2008-2009 was 140 US dollars a barrel. A few months ago, it was 38 US dollars a barrel. Today, it's about 62 US dollars a barrel. What can we do about it? We simply price control it. Whatever price it lands in Fiji, we then subsequently price control it. The other thing that we don't have a control over is cyclones. After Cyclone Winston, a small bunch of bananas in Suva cost $20. Normally, it cost $5, because all the banana trees went down. Long beans cost $5 a bundle, because the Valley Road and Bar and all that got flooded. Yangona was $200 a kilo after Winston. It's about $140 a kilo till today, good Yangona. Some Yangona farmers are very wealthy. I was with the Honorable PM a few months back in, uh, in Vanuilevu. One farmer sold his crops for $2 million. Good money. Some people still drink it at the same rate. <laughs> but you see, when we measure inflation, we take a basket of what we call everyday items to measure inflation. So, inflation rate in 2015 was 1.6%. Alcohol, tobacco and kava contributed 06 The rest of the goods contributed 1%. 2016, after Winston, inflation rate was 3.9%, of which 2.7% came from alcohol, tobacco and kava. 2.7% out of 3.9. 1.2% was the rest of the stuff. See, fuel price is relatively low too. 2017, 2.8%. 2% was alcohol, tobacco and kava. Because kava was very high. The rest of the stuff was 0 0.8. But look at the permutation now. Up to June 2018. 4.6%. 1.7% contributed by alcohol and tobacco and kava. But the rest of the stuff is 2.9. Permutation has changed. Price of fuel has now gone up. So these are the things that affect inflation. Many of the food items that we do have, of course, we grow it locally. And that generally gets affected only by things like cyclones or maybe a disease. You know, for example, if you get some kind of disease in a particular root crop, then those, that particular root crop won't be available. But as far as all the imported food items are concerned, we have absolutely no control over it. Price of fuel can vary depending on Donald Trump's policy in the Middle East. If there's a war in the Middle East. Or you'll notice when the Commerce Commission every three months does a review of the pricing, when it's a very cold winter in the Northern Hemisphere, the price of fuel goes up. Because the Europeans and North Americans need more fuel to keep warm. They consume more fuel. So there's a huge demand, price of it will go up. And we bear the consequences. It'd be nice if we found oil ourselves. Until then, we have to depend on the prices set by world market price. Foreign reserves. A lot of people don't understand much about foreign reserves. 
I'll have to pick somebody. So assuming this young lady here, who's on the phone, the phone that she's on is not made in Fiji. I assume the earring she's wearing is not made in Fiji either. She may have gel in her hair, that's not made in Fiji either. <laughs> Some of the stuff she has on an item, she's wearing a watch, is not made in Fiji either. I'm holding this, this pointer, it's not made in Fiji. This is not made in Fiji. These lights aren't made in Fiji. The air condition is not made in Fiji. When we want to buy these things, all these wonderful cars on the road, not, none of them are made in Fiji. When we buy these things, we need to buy them in the dollars and cents that they sell it to us in. They don't sell it to us in Fijian dollars, they sell it to us in Japanese yen, US dollars, Euros, Australian dollars. So you need to have enough foreign currency to trade. That's why foreign reserves are very, very important. It says over here, this over here is the number of months you can trade in foreign reserves. That line there. So the international benchmark is that you should have at least four months worth of foreign reserves to be a, in a healthy position. That's a good sign. Generally, when countries don't have enough foreign reserves, they say, oh, that country is going bankrupt. They can't buy stuff from overseas. You can see where foreign reserves was in 2006, $515 million, well below the benchmark. Well below the benchmark. Today, we have about $2.1 billion worth of foreign reserves. But the interesting thing is this. If you look at, say, 2010, the foreign reserves there was $1.3 billion. If you take that across, that's about 4.8 months worth of foreign reserves. You see? It's about 4.8 months worth of foreign reserves. Today, we have $2.1 billion dollars nearly double, but we have only five months worth of foreign reserves. Why? Because our economy is growing. People need more goods from overseas. As you become wealthier, you want to buy all the nice stuff. Today we have more cars on the roads, so more people want to buy cars. So they spend more, we need more Japanese yen. Today, as we speak, somebody somewhere in Fiji is getting connected to electricity. We are spending $50 million this year's budget for rural electrification, electrification generally. Now, the moment you connect a village or connect a home to electricity, what do they do? They go and buy a fridge. They go and buy a microwave. They buy a phone so they can charge their phones, so they can use their phones. They may buy a TV or maybe two. They buy a stereo. All these things are not made in Fiji. So as people get more access to services, and they get more money in their pockets, the civil servants have got a pay rise, they might go and buy a new watch, might buy a new car. All of this stuff needs to come from overseas. So there's pressure on the foreign reserves. So even though in 2010 here, you had only $1.3 billion, it was about nearly 4.8 months worth of trading, Today, with 2.1 billion is about five months worth of trading because we know the economy is growing, so there will be huge demand for that. We have a lot of these homes being built. What do they do? They buy all these sinks. They buy all this fancy plumbing stuff. None of that is made in Fiji. So as you have more construction, more things from overseas is required. The tiles, everything. Now, a lot of people talk about debt in Fiji without understanding debt. Of course, debt has become politicized. It's become politicized in Fiji now. There are two ways of measuring debt. The first way of measuring debt, of course, which is the much better way of measuring debt, is as a percentage of your GDP. As a percentage of our GDP, debt has been falling. Falling, sorry. It's about 47% of our GDP. Gross domestic product. In nominal terms, our debt is now today $5.1 billion. That's our true position of our debt. Now, let me tell you what happens with government, governmental debt. Governmental debt works this way. When Fiji became independent, the Ratumara government borrowed money. They borrowed lots of money to build things, etc. So when they borrow money, they have to pay the debt. Of course, after 1987, we had, after he lost the elections, we had Dr. Bavanda's government for four weeks. Unfortunately, for four weeks only. So when he was there, he would have had to borrow money also to run government. But he would have to pay the debt of the Ratumara government. 
Then you had the Rambuka government after 87. He borrowed money also, his government borrowed money also. He pays the debt of the Bavandra government and the Ratumara government. Then you had the Chaudhry government. The Chaudhry government borrowed money also. But he has to pay the debt of the Rambuka government, the Bavandra government, the Ratumara government. Then you have the Garase government. They borrowed money also. But they have to pay everybody else's debt also. But by this stage, probably a lot of the debt of the Ratumara government is paid because generally government debt is about 30 years. So then, of course, the Baini Marama government is appointed in 2007. And they have to pay the debt of the Garase government, the Chaudhry government, the Rambuka government, etc. They also incurred debt. Then, of course, you have the Fiji First government. They borrowed money also. They have to pay everybody else's debt. When the Baini Marama government was appointed in 2006, the debt levels of the Fijian government was $2.8 billion. That's the amount of debt the Baini Marama government inherited from the previous governments. And that debt now accumulates to make $5.1 billion. So the difference between that and that is the amount of money that the Baini Marama government has borrowed, including the Fiji First government. So we are paying the debts of other governments too. Now the good thing is that the Fijian government, irrespective under whoever's prime ministership it has been, has never defaulted on a debt. We've always paid everybody else's debt. And that's a good position to be in. Because some governments actually default. So Fiji has got a good credit rating in that sense. Now, let me put it simply. If, for example, I have $100. I have $100. I go and borrow $20. So you would say my debt ratio is 20%. 20 over 100 is 20%. Now, assuming I get more money, I get $500, I become wealthier. And I decide I'm going to lash out. Instead of borrowing $20, I'm going to borrow $50. Two and a half times more than what I borrowed. So I've doubled my debt in dollar value to $50. But as a percentage of my GDP, 50 over 500 is 10%. So the more your economy grows, the more capacity you have to borrow. And you're in a healthier position even though your nominal or the dollar value has increased. The question you need to ask is this. Why is the government borrowing? What is it using the borrowed money for? And you must always borrow not to operate, but you must always borrow to build. And build your productive capacity. So you see, the example that I always give is that if you, for example, I assume somebody is a fisherwoman. She all goes out and catches fish. She's got no electricity though. She catches the fish. She comes by the roadside near her house. She puts the fish out on the, on the bench. You drive along, she says, $50 a bunch. A bundle, sorry. $50 a bundle for fish. By midday, nobody buys it. She's getting worried. Because she knows that if she doesn't sell it, she either eat, has to eat it herself again, or it might rot. And then by 2 o'clock, you come along, you know that she hasn't sold the fish, you start bargaining with her. You say to her, you know, I'll give you $25, give me the whole lot. She might sell it to you. So her value of that fish was $50, now she's only got $25. The moment she's got electricity, she knows she's got access to ice, and she knows that if she does not sell the fish or she cannot sell the fish, she can keep it in the cooler, she won't bring down her price. She won't sell it, she don't sell it for less than $50. She'll put it away in the fridge. Next day, she'll put it out again, throw, fresh, uh, throw water on it. You drive along, she say, fresh fish for sale, 50 bucks. It's true. You've increased her productive capacity. You've increased her income level. The same with farmers. You go to Valley Road, Singatoka. A lot of the farmers, when they harvest the vegetable, if they don't have cooling facilities, the middleman comes and buys an entire sack of cabbage for $5. Then sells a bundle of cabbage for two fifty to you. Make a huge margin. But that farmer has to sell it to him because he knows if he harvests the cabbage now, or if he doesn't harvest it, harvest it the cabbage will rot. We'll get, he won't get anything for it. So that's what you call building productive capacity. Now, Fiji's 
debt to GDP ratio, of course, is now 47%. Of course, it would have been lower if we did not have Winston, Kenny, and Josie. We've spent close to $550 million because of these three disasters. That's why we don't like cyclones. Apart from the fact it kills people, it puts a huge burden, financial burden, on government resources. Now, let's look at other countries. What's their debt to GDP ratio? Look at Japan, 239.2% debt to GDP ratio. Singapore, 112%. USA, 107.4%. Canada, 92.3%. Nobody says these countries are going under. You've got some smart people over here saying Fiji is going under. You've got a debt of $5.5 billion. No understanding whatsoever. Now, if you compare ourselves to other countries, where do they sit? Maldives, these are island states, Seychelles, Nauru, Mauritius, Tuvalu, Samoa, Fiji. That's where we sit. Now, what does this translate in dollar terms? What does it actually mean in dollar terms? That's in US dollars. Japan's debt is $11.8 trillion. You can go and Google this. You'll find it on the Google pages, whatever. Singapore's debt is $32.7 billion. The United States is the most debt-ridden country in the world. $19.9 trillion worth of debt. But everybody wants to go to USA. You see, the point here is this. If you look at Japan, percent of GDP is 239.2 percent. Debt is 11.8 trillion. USA is 107.4, but 19.9. More in terms of dollar value than Japan, but less in percentage. Why? Because the US economy is bigger than the Japanese economy. So it's the ability to soak it up. So that's, that's why as a percent of GDP, it's lower. But in dollar terms, it's higher. <coughs> Look at Fiji, it's 2.47 billion. This is US dollars. Of course, you translate that into Fijian dollars, it's about oh, a little over $5 billion. Now, I went to Mauritius about 18 months ago, very similar to Fiji, tourism, uh, sugar based and then tourism. They decided to do what we are doing, but on a much grander scale. They decided to put four lane roads, you know, upgrade the infrastructure, street lights, set up ICT parks. Went to India, got two or three Indian hospitals to come and set up shop in Mauritius. The advantage that they have is that they're quite close to Africa. Of course, Africa is the fastest growing continent in the world now. Very young population based. But of course, there's also a reputation linked to Africa. The moment you say Africa, people say, oh, you know, war, maybe civil war, not very safe. Mauritius then marketed itself really well. So they went to the um, international companies. They said, look, Come and set up your international uh, offices here, and you can service Africa from here. It's only two and a half hours away, three hours away. You can service Africa from here, and guess what they all did? So you have your IBMs, all the big companies have set up shop in Mauritius to service Africa. They gave them free land, developed the land, set up your ICT parks. It's beneficial for them, it creates jobs, high-end jobs. That's one of the things that we are doing, but in a smaller scale. We're doing one in Warimbitia and Lotoka at the moment to invite companies to set up shop there. But they did in a grander scale. Then they went to the rich Africans and said, look, you want an open heart surgery? Don't go to Europe, don't go to India. Come to Mauritius, we've got all these hospitals here. You're only two hours away, very close to your family. And when you do that surgery, we can throw in two weeks of holiday in our nice resort. So you see their debt level, they built a fantastic airport, 7.5 billion US, 62.7%, but it's good debt, productive debt. So that's how you need to look at debt. Where is it being spent? How are we spending it? Do we have the capacity to pay it? Of course we do. Of course there are some people are saying that we're being sold out to the Chinese and China is going to take over. It's all nonsense. This is our debt. There are two types of debt. You can source your debt domestically and you can source your debt externally. Foreign debt. We like to keep what we call a 70-30 mix. We like to keep 70% of our debt onshore 30% of the debt offshore. So at the moment, 29.7% 29, 29 of our debt is what we call external debt. And who are the people we borrowed from externally? ADB, International Fund for Agricultural Development, World Bank, JICA, Exim Bank of China, 
global bond for $16 million. Now, with these are what you call sovereign debts. Sovereign debt is when you don't have any mortgage over your assets. They lend to us simply because we are a government. And they, li they rely on the fact that we are a sovereign government. We have a guarantee. We don't give a mortgage. So when Rambuka said that they are going to take over our ports and all this, it's all nonsense. The Chinese, the Exim Bank of China, they f gave the first loan to the Garase government. There was a small loan for the development of the ICT uh, complex at Berkeley Crescent. But then the Beni Marama government borrowed money from Exim Bank of China to do seven projects. And we have not borrowed any money from them since 2012. And I'll tell you what the seven projects are. Number one to Draketi Ta Ceiling of the Road. Buddha Bay Ta Ceiling of the Road. Sawani Syria, Ta Ceiling of the Road. Singatoga Valley Road, Ta Ceiling of the Road. Moto in Ba, Ta Ceiling of the Road and building the nice big bridge. And the Housing Authority subdivision up here in Tathirua. And also in uh, one uh, Rewai, PRB, building of the PRB blocks. They are the seven projects. So the debt exposure is $516 million, which is nothing. It's only about 4.7% of our GDP. So that's the true position of the debt. But we like to keep our debt mixture 70 to 30. We like to keep more domestic debt than foreign debt. Now, very quickly before I finish off, like I mentioned to you, there are two types of spending a government has. One is operating expenditure, and the other one, of course, is capital expenditure. Operating expenditure is the day-to-day -day running of the government. Capital expenditure is when you spend money to build things. Now, from 1980 to 2006, 27 years, whichever government was there, all the governments combined, spent $3.5 billion in building things. You know, roads, bridges, jetties, whatever it was, schools and all that. And the debt increased to $2.6 billion, by $2.6 billion. From the Beni Marama government to the Fiji First government, in 11 years, we've spent $7 billion in capital infrastructure. In other words, double that amount but our debt increased by $2.3 billion. Why? Because for every dollar of capital expenditure the previous governments had, they borrowed 76 cents. Every dollar they spent to build something, they borrowed 76 cents. We have borrowed only 36 cents. Why? Because we have what we call our operating savings. And that's here. You see, these are the, we tracked it from 1980, how much savings governments had if any, right throughout. So we have been increasing our savings. Our savings this year, we expect to anticipate a savings of a little over $1 billion. So we pay the day-to-day -day expenses, we have a saving of $1 billion, then we want to build things, then we use the savings first. Then after that, if we need more money, then we go and borrow. So obviously you have to borrow less if you save more. The same way with, the, with your own savings. If you have a lot of savings when you buy a house, if you put in more of your money, you borrow less. <coughs> we spend about 40% of our uh, budget on capital expenditure. So, ladies and gentlemen, of course, it's a uh, uh, very Fijian family focused. Uh, we build upon previous budgets. Many people did not realize that many of the clues for this budget we gave two, three years ago. And we put in many clues in this year's budget for the budgets to come. So if you're actually discerning, you'll see the, it's all the hidden stuff is there. Economy has been growing for nine years, and of course, fiscal position remains strong. Now, you can go to this website now that you've got very fast internet speed, and it's free. You can go and get all this information. First of all, you have the budget book. This entire book is on, this, on the page. So I've just opened here. Ministry of Women, Children, Poverty Elevation, Social Welfare, Institutional Services, Program 2, Activity 1. They're going to spend on Seg 9, purchase of land, Fiji Juvenile Rehabilitation Center, $50,000. Expenses for juveniles, $20,000. Every single it item is actually set out here. You can go and look. It may be good for your studies too, to know what's, going, what's happening. You'll also find these flyers. Fiji Roads Authority, where are they building roads? Which roads will get upgraded? Where will be the task ceiling done? Footpaths, street lights, Water Authority, Fiji. Where will the water tanks be delivered? Which water tank? Which village? What's the size of the water tank? Is all listed here. Rural electrification program. So, for example, it says here, if you open it, Western Division, 
it says, Noto Levu Village Tavua, 10 applicants, cost of $79,000. Harry Charan Sanjay Prasad, Wuna Kawanrawa Subdivision, Koravuto Nendi, 13 applicants, cost of $34,000. So all these people will get connected to electricity. Everything is here. So you may be over here, you may come from this area, you can ring us up and say, hey, what's happening to my area? I've had people actually do that to me. So all this information is available here. All of these flyers, infrastructure, everything is here. And you can get all that information. Now, the other thing before I finish and open up for the floor, uh, open up to the, for you to ask questions, we've also made an amendment to the FNU Act. And the amendment to the FNU Act now is that the way that your council will consist of is now going to change. Before, your council members were made up by different organizations giving in their nominations. So the Trade Union Congress, the Law Society, etc. would give in names and they would then become the members of the council. That's going to change now. So now the minister has to appoint people who actually can offer Oh, sorry, you have adequate qualifications, skills, expertise, and knowledge to contribute to the disciplines offered by the university and the general administration and financial management of the tertiary institution. You also now must elect your student reps to the council, one from undergraduate studies and one from postgraduate studies. And also, the, uh, we'll be conducting those elections very soon, hopefully, so you can get a full council. So please go and vote for the student that you want to represent you on the council for undergrad studies, and those of you who postgraduate studies, for those who can represent uh, you at the postgraduate level. There are some of the changes that have been brought about. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.